All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, my name is Randall Stevens. I am going to spend the better part of the next hour talking about our integration with Revit and some work that we've been doing on around an upgraded browser and workflow um, specific to Revit. Again, my name is Randall Stevens. I'm the CEO of Avail. Um, among other duties, I still spend quite a bit of time with the dev team and uh, on the product side of things. So I'm happy to spend this time with you all to kind of walk through the direction that we're taking uh, on this front and um, give you a preview of what we think are some exciting things and hopefully you'll find some exciting things to come. So thanks again for joining us. I've got my colleague, um, at least one colleague, Will Rouse, Todd Trevisano, looks like he jumped on as well, but um, they're gonna help me uh, wrangle if you'll have questions along the way. Uh, just feel free to put them in um, uh, in the chat or ask the questions through the question, the official question and answer feature of Zoom. And uh, we should have plenty of time and I'll get those answered, um, if not along the way, um, at the end of this session. So um, just as a reminder, uh, we released a uh, you know, a, a feature update, what we would consider a major update that included new features uh, back in late September, right before Autodesk University uh, called Avail Desktop 4.3. Um, if you haven't put your hands on it, you should uh, get it downloaded. There are some great new features, among which are key cards. Uh, I'll show you what that looks like if you haven't seen them. Uh, there's a dy new dynamic paths feature. Um, there's some updates to the way notifications work, which uh, should be handy for those of you that are working with uh, with Avail uh, on a daily basis from a publishing uh, standpoint. You get some better feedback. And then we also um, uh, released uh, two new marketplace channels, what we call Avail Select, which is our first foray into manufacturer content. Uh, we did a webinar a couple of weeks ago uh, where we ran through that with customers uh, a little more directly just of what the strategy was there and what we're doing on that front. But if you are an enterprise customer of Avail, you should be able to go over to the marketplace and find those Avail select channels and turn them on. And I'll talk a little bit today about, um, about some of the things that we're doing and how that will affect that. Um, key cards, uh, for those of you that haven't seen them yet, um, if you have been using Avail since the 4.0 release, you know we had uh, what we call channel cards, which show up on the front, uh, a visual way of being able to represent these channels. Uh, we've got a new feature called key cards, which is actually inside of a channel. It's data driven, which is probably the most important part of this. Uh, and it basically provides what I call visual gateways kind of into your content, into your content. So this is an example. Uh, one, once I jump in and doing a live uh, demo today, uh, you'll get to see some of these key cards in action, but it basically lets you uh, have a, a much more visual kind of uh, a, a way of organizing or getting to your information inside of a channel as opposed to just seeing the content itself. Um, so that's been a very popular feature uh, already. People are putting that to use. Um, I will say, watch for uh, as early as next week, we're actually gonna launch a contest uh, where we're gonna have our customers who have already started using this kind of show off what they've done. Uh, so watch for some more information about that. Uh, that'll run through uh, into the first of the year. So that'll be kind of a fun, fun to see what everybody's been doing with that feature. Uh, the, uh, the other major feature in 4.3 that we released is what we call dynamic paths. Um, you know, we consider this an extension of our strategy to help support all the different places, the different file systems where you may have your content being stored. Uh, as you dig into um, cloud storage, either with BIM 360 or OneDrive and SharePoint, uh, probably don't have to tell any of you that are, are fighting this, that there are challenges with the way that data a lot of times is cached or stored on the local user's machine. Um, so this dynamic paths feature in Avail set out to solve this. Uh, we basically use very similar to what you would consider like an environment variable to uh, basically um, resolve those addresses on each person's machine uniquely so that you can store your data in BIM 360 or SharePoint OneDrive, uh, put little um, 
orange boxes around the three there. We concentrated on on the Autodesk uh, platform and the and the Microsoft uh, platforms where a lot of customers have things stored. Uh, but you may you can see all these other logos. There's lots of other cloud first kind of storage locations. Uh, if you've got one of those and having issues with it, just contact uh, our customer success team and they can help you kind of talk through how you can actually get the uh, dynamic path set up to potentially help solve some of those problems there as well. The reason that we didn't just turn them all on is we actually, um, the software actually goes and tries to look in the registry where these things are um, to, to see where they are on your machine. Um, how they're set up on your machine. And um, obviously there's lots of different registry uh, uh, in order to automate that. Um, and then we also just wanted to make sure as we just roll, just now rolling this feature out that that we understand it fully, uh, what I would say in the wild and see uh, the way that each of your net respective networks are acting and to just make sure that this um, feature is helping to solve those problems. <clears throat> um, along with the 4.3 release then, we also put into uh, what we call preview release um, the a, a new avail browser for Revit. Uh, we've incremented naming this 5.0. What you'll see is that we're on a march now into next year for a major kind of 5.0 upgrade. So we're beginning to align. Uh, this was a major change to the way that the avail browser for Revit is running. So we went ahead and incremented up to 5.0. And that's going to dovetail into a major 5.0 um, desktop release uh, that will be sometime probably late first half of the year. So probably in the spring. Uh, what you will see, though, is that there are and I'll, I'll show you a roadmap slide uh, before we get off uh, the call today. Uh, there are a bunch of features that we're going to be dropping between now and then. So rather than doing a bunch of work and then dumping it on you all at once, we tend to release these features as they become available so that you can begin to start using them. And then uh, the way we think about the kind of 5.0 release for the desktop, it'll be kind of a culmination of a series of, of tools that we're working on uh, that, that will uh, manifest themselves then kind of culminate in this major 5.0 platform update um, uh, sometime in the first half of the year. Um, another uh, feature that we uh, released, we updated Harvest for Revit to include material support in what we call 2.2 release. The reason that we put that out and called it a preview release, basically beta, was that it, in order to handle the materials, Revit materials, it requires this new browser. So we didn't put it out into the production because uh, those that weren't uh, already installing the Avail browser for Revit wouldn't even be able to bring those materials in. So we kind of put these out in tandem what I'm going to spend today to talk about is this new about avail browser for Revit. Uh, some of you've already got your hands on it. Uh, there's a few changes, but I'm going to show you, kind of walk you through why we've made some of the um, decisions that we've made, uh, the direction that we're going in on that front, and hopefully you'll like what you see. I'll show you some new stuff that uh, it's a, it's a little bit uh, delayed, I'd say, in getting it out into production because I'll show you we've got some other features that we're trying to get in there before we finally put it out in as a full production uh, release. All right, so the first question uh, that I'll ask and answer, you know, what drove this development? Um, so, uh, you know, I'll get a little philosophical, but, you know, simpler, you know, Part of what I'm gonna walk you through is that there was some complexity that had been introduced over time, right? This is about five years of accumulated complexity in the way that we were handling Revit content. And our belief is that simpler is better. And I put in quotes here is often better. Sometimes the nature of what you're doing just in itself is complex and it's hard, uh, but we're always striving here to think about how to simplify things. And this is just one great example of that. Uh, the kind of, you know, continue that thought, though, you know, simple is always hard to do. And that's what I'm always reminding the team is like, um, yes, there are easy ways to do things, uh, but easy doesn't always mean better. Uh, usually easy means complex. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. So the hard work, hopefully, that you'll see that we've done. Um, I've said this before, if you've heard me on other webinars. Whenever we do kind of major updates or releases, 
I'm always happiest when I know that the software has gotten better and maybe it's doing more things, but it feels like it's gotten simpler. That's always to me a testament that the team has been really working from a design standpoint and thinking through the problem and ultimately trying to simplify this. You know, and, and I'll step back and say, when you are uh, developing something that we, you know, something like a veil that's a content management platform, for most of our customers, this largely sits on everybody's desk, so it affects a lot of people. Uh, and then I think this also goes back to simpler is always better if you're really going to get usage and traction and get the value out of these tools. The simpler it is, the better, the more value you're probably going to get out of it. So hopefully you'll see that what we're doing uh, on this front around Revit is definitely moving in that direction. So uh, let me start out by just giving you kind of what the current state. Um, I've got some bullet points that I'll run through here. And then I'll also show you some images, uh, you know, of, of what the current browser uh, that you're either uh, have been using or continuing to use. Um, <clears throat> there's always been, uh, you know, and I can, I can go all the way back. Obviously, I was involved in some of the decisions uh, but, uh, about how all this came about. But you know, there's we have a desktop app which we've been continuing to put more and more effort into. Uh, uh, we think that that is the 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 place where most of the work is gonna happen in a veil. Uh, it's, it, in, in my mind, it has more to do with real estate, how many pixels we need on the screen to do the kinds of things that we're doing and how much real estate you're gonna take up to do it uh, and to give that a uh, great experience. Um, but we have always had you know, plugins or add-ins into specific software, Revit specifically, because we're doing um, just the nature of the way that we have to handle content and the things that we're doing, we have to have a plugin. But there was, uh, you know, at some point, uh, a couple of years, uh, probably a couple of years into the introduction of Avail, we really started beefing up that uh, kind of Revit interface and and basically have what we call standalone mode there uh, and or you could use it tethered to the desktop. So it created this just complexity that we've been fighting ever since we made those decisions. Um, you know, these are my words, you know, we, we try to handle too many things uh in, in the add-in interface in that plug-in interface you know as the nature of the beast is that as you do new things or want to do new things uh, we call it feature creep um, you can end up getting lots of new features they just end up getting bolted on and uh, like many things right you know, even in design and construction in the physical world anytime you're doing renovations or adding things on you can end up with something that maybe ventures off the original intent or uh, you know if it were if you were able to rethink it from from the ground up uh, you would probably make some different design uh, considerations so the same thing goes when we're working on these software products um, that plug-in interface that you're currently using unless you've been using the the, the new beta right it, it included a browser which lets you browse uh, channels it had search features built into it uh, we tried, you know, we were trying to incorporate the filters panel. Uh, so a lot of the features, you know, what we were always fighting was every time we would develop a new feature that would be primarily driven for the, in the desktop, the first questions people would ask is when's that going to show up in these browsers? And we just knew that it, those are always going to be at odds because now we're trying to do maybe some very complex things in the desktop interface that became very difficult to do in these browser interfaces. Um, you know, there's a type catalog handler that had to happen uh, inside of inside of that interface in Revit. Um, the the thing that we ended up getting into was, you know, panels could be minimized and overlooked because we were trying to do so many different things that it just got harder and harder for somebody, um, you know, to use and to and to know how to use. Uh, so here are some. Uh, these are just some. Uh, you know, because we're obviously. Uh, uh, building training tools and doing different marketing uh, training efforts along the way, I was able to go and grab, I don't know which version of the browser, this may go back a bit, but um, you know, you can see here, right, we're doing, we're trying to, in this interface, do search, you know, you could, you could uh, browse, you know, uh, through the channels, see the results, you know, you got to scroll through, but, you know, as you know, if there's a lot of content, this isn't a whole lot of space to be able to do that. What you're missing in this kind of interface are like the high resolution previews. You know, if you're looking at your drafting views and want to see those in all their glory, uh, this was just not the best interface to be able to do that in. Um, 
just another example, uh, here's, you know, the event browser. Again, there's uh, pull down menus then for trying to see which channels and as your number of channels would grow over time, that was not the best interface for being able to navigate that. Uh, there was a search box, uh, right, for searching within that channel. There were display control tools that were showing up in this interface, obviously trying to browse and see the content and the names of the content. Down at the bottom, there's a little filters panel that would show up if, if this uh, browser were open to a certain width. You had to know to open it. Uh, just all of these kinds of, you know, what in hindsight were a buildup of complexity for this. Here's an example where, you know, now there's the ability, if you had type catalogs, you need to open this up. And a lot of, you know, in seeing and talking to a lot of end users, they may not even know that that was there or wasn't painfully aware that it was there. So there was just lots of complexity, right? And here's your type catalogs and menu items to be able to show this. And then different ways to try to load all this information. So you can see, uh, you know, if, if, as you stand back and look at this, that there's just a lot trying to go on. It's a very limited amount of space. This was also, you know, configurable by users. So if they shrunk, you know, the width of this, we couldn't display everything. That's why we had to close panels and open panels. So um, just a lot of complexity. Um, if you were working with Revit, um, you know, container uh, libraries or warehouse libraries. There was this complexity of us, you know, being able to single click to select something so that we could display and then tab out, you know, the views, the families, the sheets, all the important stuff that we were trying to support so that you could better manage and, and, and do a better job around the Revit content uh, and the complexities of that Revit content. But again, it just created what became a very complex interface. And then uh, for those of you that, you know, may not even be aware, there's a little button up at the top right, which was really an experimental mode, uh, what we call project mode. But this allowed um, this allowed you to and does allow you to navigate the data that's actually inside your project. So by double clicking, you could actually open up a, a you know preview windows, actually open up your Revit windows and navigate. So I'm going to talk a little bit of, in a minute about where we're going on that front uh, because there, we are continuing to think about this and developing some new features around this. But again, that was a completely different mode that you had to know how to flip it between. So it just created complexity in all of these interfaces. So uh, I'm gonna let you read this. Uh, this is a nice quote, I think, uh, that's apropos to what I'm discussing here from Steve Jobs. And uh, I'll let you read that. I'll take a drink of water. So I, uh, I, you know, I liked using this quote because I do think it it very succinctly kind of gets to the point of of what I hope that you'll find that we've done. You know, yes, we went out trying to solve these problems. Those problems evolved over time. Uh, you put solutions out, you do the best you can, and uh, and try to do that at the same time, just always trying to accelerate development. And you know, a part of this is also anytime you ever develop features, and this is why simpler is better. Every time you put a feature out there, if you know, if even a single person in our audience begins using it and nobody else does, it's it's painful to take it away <laughs> because it gets very complex. So that's why most software, you know, not just what we're doing in Avail, but almost all the software that you interact with becomes complex over time because you just, you know, it's just you keep adding on things and trying to do more. And it's very hard to do that and uh, and to make it simple. All right, so we set out uh, to really begin rethinking this from the ground up. Um, we were able to use a lot of the code that was already written, but we really focused, and we started back last spring, uh, this past spring on this initiative. And what we began looking at was, um, you know, a lot of the, the, a lot of those interfaces were what we would call, uh, you know, kind of required you to A, know to open up these panels, and we were trying to display a lot of information. So use type catalogs as an example, where it's like, well, you're, you're going to browse and you got to touch, select a piece of content. And then you got this panel has to be open so you can see the type catalogs. And then you've got to have these interfaces for, uh, you know, pre-selecting those and then bringing them into your project. So we began talking about this as, you know, let's let's invert the flow of this. Where you're going to see that we're, we're concentrating is, can the user 
you know, let's separate the searching finding and the rest of this complexity. So what we're doing is moving towards using the desktop interface, which is, you know, our best effort towards a very clean, simple way to search, you know, verify through high resolution previews, find the information that you're that you're looking for. And then ultimately, we're trying to move everything to be a simple drag and drop, including everything that's going on in Revit. So if you've been using our harvest utility, you'll know that the move has been towards can we make everything that is Revit content, whether it's a family or uh, a drafting view or sheet, can we just drag it over into the current project? And that's the flow. So when we talked about inverting the flow, uh, what we meant by that was let's let the user, let's concentrate on as simply as we can make it for them to find what they're looking for, drag it onto the project, drag it into Revit. And then if there's anything that we need to ask them secondarily, we can pop up these menus instead of that having to be known and always in your face. Uh, so uh, it becomes kind of a secondary uh, process. So as I said, we're really leveraging the pixel real estate and the features that are being developed that those key cards are going over. Everybody, I'll just say, loves them. So you're going to see a lot more of that kind of visual organizational tools inside of the desktop, which are going to help people uh, get to the information that they're trying to get to. Um, so real emphasis on searching, browsing, filtering, all of that kind of going on in the desktop app. With the 4.3 release, uh, those of you that have already started using it, uh, one of the other, I didn't call it out in, in the slide, but we've moved to that being what we would call persistent. So in other words, when you, when you start it, right, it, it can take a few seconds, several seconds for the application to actually go from a cold start to running. Now, when you hit the X at the top of the desktop, it'll go away out of your way, but it's actually still running in the system tray. So that's what we would call persistent. And what that allows, though, is that when we need to trigger that to come back up in front of you know, front and center, it's instantaneous. And you'll see that when I uh, demo that here in, in a second. Um, so, um, so speed, you know, simple and fast is always the criteria that we're trying to go for. Um, so then we ultimately try to move to this very simple drag and drop of all content and then initiating secondary actions like type selection when they're needed. Um, otherwise, you just drag and drop and you can start placing, modeling, uh, uh, doing what you need to do with that content. Uh, the other part of this then was we wanted to continue to support uh, what you're doing with your container libraries. We hope that you're moving towards using Harvest to kind of get people out of the actual RBT file, at least in the way that the interfaces work for all this content. But, uh, but we did still, we're supporting the RBT file. In fact, now you can actually drag an actual RBT file over onto Revit when you've got the available browser installed, our software installed. And we basically intercept that and begin to then do a secondary kind of pop-up or process. So if you've got a container library uh, that you're already using, you're not going to lose support of that people. In fact, they can select it and the dialogue will be open, but if they initiate a drag action, it'll just open that right up to them. So that's pretty slick. Um, this is back, you know, what I was just saying, backwardly compatible with your existing container libraries. And then um, what I'm going to show you that we're still working on that's kind of holding up getting this out there, we're working on, there will still, we're, we're working on some new interfaces that are going to end up living in Revit. Uh, the first of which will just be a search box where you can initiate search uh, and or get the desktop uh, uh, launched. But I'll show you that there's uh, some interesting new uh, features that we're, that we're adding that are going to add some value there. So I'm going to take another drink of water and then I'm going to give you a live demo. Any, uh, any questions or anything come up yet, guys? No questions so far. All right. So let's do this. I am going to, so I've got Revit open. Uh, I am going to open the desktop. So there you see, because it never did, it didn't really close. That's why it starts up so quickly uh, when you're in that mode, that's the persistent mode. Uh, I'm just gonna go full screen with, uh, with the Avail desktop for a second. Uh, just as a reminder, if you haven't used these, uh, these wonderful key cards yet, um, you know, they allow you to do things like going into a channel of Revit content like I have here. And rather than just seeing all the content, 
Uh, we're basically using the Revit category data to drive these through what we call key cards. Uh, so this, you know, is basically executing search, but, you know, as I click on those things, uh, and then you can see we have what we call a, a banner uh, view, which lets me now filter out uh, between other data. All of this is the metadata, right, that you have on your content being elevated and supported in these visual interfaces. And then these crumb trails, right, when you are navigating through these, allow you to move back and forth through these interfaces. So uh, really nice, um, you know. Once you start using them, it's hard to remember when you didn't have them. It's one of those kinds of features. Um, so that uh, you know, that's what the key cards look like. What I'm going to show you is that um, uh, what the new drag and drop uh, kind of interactions look like. So if I go back into that channel of Revit content, and let's just use casework because a lot of times that has nice type catalogs that go along with it. What I'm going to do, right? I'm looking for content. I'm searching, browsing. I'm using normally this desktop is going to be on a second monitor, not your primary monitor where Revit would be. But obviously, for the sake of this webinar, I'll have these kind of fighting for screen real estate on top of each other. But what you'll see is that you know once I've found the piece of content that I want to use or I want to bring into the project, all I have to do is drag and drop that over onto Revit. And then what you see is that immediately a dialogue pops up. So this is the Revit, the available browser for Revit now uh, reduced to this kind of secondary function. So in this case, right, there's multiple types. So you'll notice that by dragging that family over, it didn't automatically put me in placement mode because we're still driving towards that kind of additive process, like only bring the family types in that you want to use. But you will also see that there's support here for, um, you know, if I want to bulk load multiple, um, you know, items into the project, I can do that with one button click. Um, I can, I've got some nice new little menus here. This, this is uh, been under development. So the version that you downloaded in preview may look a little bit different than this, but uh, we've been working through how easily you can either load everything, uh, individually select, and or you know select a piece of content and then if you want to bring that into the into the current model I can just drag and drop and now I'm just placing that single um, that that family with that single type in is being brought into the project uh, at that point so that uh, makes that really nice if I bring that desktop back up and selected a different family and this dialogue is still open you don't have to close it you can you know choose to either leave that open. But if a user has, you know, closed that interface and they're coming back to bring new content in, then all they do is initiate a drag process to get that dialog to pop back up. They can also, you know, uh, get it from the, uh, 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 you know, they'll be able to launch it from the, uh, the tools within. But where we're really moving to is like, you know, the way most people do is they, they just drag that family in, right? That's the way they've always operated. So we think that this is going to get a lot more, just make it a lot easier for the end users uh, pop up. You've got a secondary choice uh, choice to make there. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I'll say is that we are still supporting bulk loading. So if I multi-selected items here, what you'll see in this interface is now that I have the option to bulk load those. And again, if this was closed and I did a multi-select and I dragged those into the project, it's just going to pop that interface up and ask me if I want to bulk load it or not. So um, pretty, pretty simple, clean, um, we think, part of the interface on that front. Um, if that is harvested content, uh, so let's go to virtualized um, libraries. Again, here's the use of key cards in front of libraries of data, including the new material support that I mentioned. So these are Revit materials. Uh, so if I, again, I can find a material, if I want to bring this into the current project, I just drag and drop it over, uh, it'll show up. And in this case, there wasn't any other choice, even though we've decided to actually pop this, even though there wasn't another choice, we thought it would be weird to not pop this menu up. Like sometimes it pops up and sometimes it doesn't. So we felt like it's better that it just pops up when you do something. In this case, there was nothing, no other secondary choice to be made, so we just load the material. 
uh, so you can see that the material got loaded into the project. If I were to do that again, what you'll see is it'll pop up now and ask me, do I want to replace that material or you know, cancel bringing it in? So you can do that. That also supports bulk loading. So again, if I wanted to multi-select a bunch of materials, uh, you can bulk load those into your project. So uh, hopefully you all will start using that new feature in Harvest and letting us know if it's, if it's being helpful or not. Um, other content types, right? If I, let's just close this dialogue. Let's say I'm looking for a system wall type and I'm going to bring uh, one of these wall types into the project. I can just simply drag and drop. Again, we're going to bring that dialogue up. But what you're going to notice is it goes, there's no, there's no other choice that the user needs to make. So it actually goes ahead and puts me in placement mode so that I can begin modeling immediately with it. So once that dialogue though is popped up, the user can move that around. They can put it wherever they want to put it on their screen. And, um, you know, it's waiting for the next piece of content to come in, right? So you can either choose to leave that open or close it down and we'll, we'll initiate bringing it back up. And this, is, this gets to where we think that the, a lot of people were, you know, were having trouble with if those dialogues got closed or that browser was closed, knowing how to get them launched, uh, just all that complexity with, with, with the interfaces and the things that we were trying to do previously. Uh, we think that this is going to help to overcome that. Um, let's see, you know, if, if this is a sheet, I know this is weird to take a title sheet and bring a drafting view, but you'll get the gist. So if I go back to where my drafting views are, and again, you get to see high resolution previews of these things, you know, again, search, verify, use the filters panel in all of its glory, use all the tools here to find what you're looking for. And then at that point, right, when you want to bring it on to, into a project, it's just a simple drag and drop. Uh, action that's happening to be able to bring uh, bring this content in, right, and place it. So, um, if um, if you were using an existing container kettle, uh, container library, as I said, um, all you have to do now in the desktop is select that, and this um, this dialog, right, that's already open, is now going to show me uh, those are the drafting views that were in that. But if I clicked on something that had more than just drafting views. So it is backwardly compatible with the display this uh, feature. If you, you know what I'm talking about if you've been using it. Uh, so it'll it'll basically reduce from that RBT what you're seeing. Uh, so we're backwardly compatible as far as that goes. And then here again, if I select this uh, container library, <clears throat> taking a second for this one to load, then you can see here, all my views, sheets, schedules, materials now are showing up uh, in that dialog. If this dialog was closed and somebody, if this was one of your container container libraries that people were using, um, all you have, all you have to do is uh, is basically drag that container library over again. So this is an RBT file, and Revit's not going to try to open that like it's a project. It's going to recognize that it's a meant to be a library item. It's going to open up this dialogue so that you can see the views, view sheet schedules, uh, anything that you've been managing uh, from that front. And then you can go ahead and use this interface for placement. So even just that alone, right? Uh, I think everybody's going to find, everybody, ever. It, it's a change in workflow and it'll require a little bit, right? If somebody's used to doing the other things, it's going to require them to have a little bit different workflow. I don't think it's that different of a workflow. And I think all the pluses of it are going to definitely overcome uh, the, the change management that's going to have to go on uh, as you would deploy this. This is also the reason why we're trying to get out ahead, not only get this out in these preview releases, but do these kinds of webinars so that we know that a lot of you do work on this kind of stuff around the end of the year, going into the first of the year, may want to think about retraining that might happen early in the in the year around this front. So we're just trying to get you get you prepped about what's possible, and what's coming. We we are you know we're not making the other interfaces that you're using. It's up to you to move this, but we're not going to be supporting those old interfaces anymore. Everything's moving to this new, and once this is out, uh, um, once this is out uh, for uh, 
production uh, deployment, all of our effort will go towards uh, towards these initiatives. All right. So, any questions uh, now before I jump into some of the newer stuff? But, uh, just a few here. There, just a question on materials. You know, like what does that um, bring in? Do you bring in visual, physical, and thermal assets? Um, um, I think the materials themselves, the the thermal. Well, let me. I'll state it like this. The entire material comes in. We're actually storing the material in the RVT file and then bringing it from RV from project to project in that transfer process. So the entire material definition is what's coming in. What isn't supported, we've got our, our tag generator for bringing in metadata. There's some properties in that in those materials like thermal properties and those things that Autodesk does not make e easy for us to get our hands on uh, as we're harvesting that. So um, we can bring in, um, we've got in the new tag generator, a definition of what material properties can come in. A lot of those thermal properties and the other things uh, aren't, uh, at least we don't know right now how to do that or do it easily. Um, so we're missing those as part of the, you know, things that would be searchable uh, from within Avail. Um, I don't know, Todd, you may know more on that front than I do. Yeah, we can we'll see that. Yeah, we can catch up on more of that uh, later around materials, but yeah. um, uh, let's see here. Um, can you preview sheets views from container files in the new Revit browser? No. And, and that's, that's a move towards everything moving towards our harvest, basically pre-running a process to abstract those visuals and display them in a better way than trying to do it on the fly dynamically because you're just limited to what Revit lets you do. So all of our move is towards using the harvest utilities uh, to, to prep this these, these kind of complex things. And then ultimately as those visuals are prepped and in the system, um, all of our interfaces are, are geared around that. So, and we're working on, I'll show you here in a minute or talk about it on the roadmap, but you know, we're working on new harvest capabilities, processing happening in Forge and just automating as much of this as possible. So, <clears throat> new and, then, and then lastly, and you maybe you'll come into this uh, later, uh, but uh, just if there's an estimate on release for this as the um, official release instead of the preview. So. Before Christmas. Ooh. So a month, you know, five, five weeks, four to six weeks from now. So I'll, so that's a good, so was there anything else before I jump into this, Todd? I think that's good for now. Yep. Okay. So, uh, so let's talk about what's kind of holding this up. So, and if we, if we can't get this, I'll just say this too. If we can't get these new features done between now and then, we will likely go ahead and put that that out into production. Because what I'm getting ready to show you, you know, and I told the team as we started working on this, let's try to get this in because I think it's a great feature and it's definitely in the direction that we're going to be going with this. So let's try to get it in. Uh, and if we can, we can. If we can't, we can't. And we'll go ahead and put it out so that you all can get into production and start taking advantage. And that's that's just the way that we try to try to operate. So, I'll, and I'll give you a quick little demo here in a second of this. But um, you know, we're introducing a new feature. Um, we're creating what we call channel groups, and this will end up manifesting itself, I think, in a bunch of cool ways towards our Avail Desktop 5.0 release. But with this Revit workflow, this became a killer, what I would call a killer feature to making the Revit experience better. So we're introducing what we call channel groups. And what this is, is a logical grouping of channels. So you can imagine a lot of our customers are doing managing a lot of different kinds of content in Avail, a subsegment of which is Revit content. So out of all of your channels, right, there's only a certain number of them that are that are about Revit content, specific to Revit content. 
So obviously, if you were going to be doing or initiating something from Revit, I don't want to say do a search uh, for a door and have channels that are being managed in Avail for a Rhino or SketchUp or, or you know any place that has the word door and have those come back in my search results. And that's the way it's been working up till now. It's like searches, you know, even the browser we've got now, you can go to any channel and it's just, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So where we're moving towards is adding this new capability, what we're gonna call channel groups. Channels will be able to be a member of more than one group. So you could take a Revit library, create a new grouping that that belongs to, but that same channel might be in another grouping. And we could give, I could give examples of where that may make sense in the future. Um, those channel groups, right, are going to then be connected logically, or you'll be able to make connections to those groups to the plugins. So in the case of Revit, if you executed a search from Revit, you would want to obviously look at Revit content first. If you were in Rhino and you were implementing some search from there, again, your priority would be if there's content that's related to Rhino. So you're going to be able to put your channels in these channel groups and then connect those channel groups down to the individual plugin interfaces or the places where search is emanating, which is basically just another way of filtering. It's basically a way of focusing the content kind of the first content that, that, that makes sense or is, is, is logical. So this is what I would call, you know, continuing this idea of contextualizing search. If I'm coming from Revit and performing a search, it probably makes sense to not search everything, but to concentrate on the content that is relevant to the work that I'm doing. So uh, this is another, this is gonna be another way, another tool for you all to put more and more context around your content that you're managing in avail and to have these tools continue to hopefully make this easier and ultimately a better experience for everyone. So what these channel groups are now going to do, and I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm going to actually turn this on and show you how it works. And I'm going to show you a quick video. We don't quite have it all wired up. It's all in dev and I couldn't get a version to run it live here today, but um, this is going to prioritize those search results uh, of when you perform these searches inside of uh, inside of Revit. So let me go back live to Revit. And I'm actually going to minimize my uh, my avail desktop so it's out of my way. And now inside of Revit, what you're going to see here is this is a part of our browser, right? And part of our angst, I'll say, on this development process is that Revit, the way Revit wants you to, to dock things, isn't you know it's always wanting you to know, like split the screen so it, you know where this little search box like could permanently live it's hard for us to control so it's gonna you know you can argue it's great it lets the user put it where they want to put it but if I were to you know dock this across the top I get a weird you know kind of gooey for just some simple search box what we are working on some new features which I'll talk about on the roadmap that are gonna likely end up adding some other features here in this screen real estate. So what I told the team when we were working on this was, let's not worry too much about, about this search interface yet, because we know that in the coming months, we're gonna be adding some new features. So let's just go ahead and get it out there so that people can start taking advantage of it. And then this interface will likely make more sense to be a dockable panel once we've added some other kind of capabilities to it. So um, this is pretty cool. So if now when I execute a search for door out of this, it just pops my desktop up, right? And performs that search. So what's going on is that search is no different than me being on the front of the Avail desktop and doing what we call a global search across all of my channels of content and bringing it back. But this is, you know, this is where it gets weird, right? I was in Revit and I just performed a search for door and I've got some channels with SketchUp models in it that hit on the, on the search for door. Well, why, you know, why is that showing up in my search results when I just did this search for them? So this is what we're trying to overcome with this new channel grouping concept. Uh, but, you know, it's pretty cool if I searched, um, this isn't, um, I don't have, we don't have that popping up there, but if I you know, search blue, here's everything that was blue, right? If I search, you know, blue car. 
there's where it's not popping that interface back up, but you know, it'll help you find car paint blue, car, right, an RPC car that's blue. So uh, you'll be able to execute these kinds of searches. You can see that we're, you know, we're trying to automatically, again, take this, simplify the interface for the user, um, you know, search for a door jam detail, type in door jam, door jam, that was hard to say, and uh, ultimately get those results very quickly. And then if I find a door jam, uh, that I'm going to, uh, you know, that I'm wanting to bring into one of my projects. Let's see if I can do this. That's harvested. Then well, that's harvest projects. Not harvesting comes in. Anyway, you get the idea. And I can drag and drop, and it'll just. <laughs> It'll pull up that other dialogue uh, whenever I do, uh, whenever I perform that search. All right, so now I'm going to go back to my slides because I'm going to show you that. So this is a recording that we did earlier. I had uh, one of the devs. So this is dev content too, but you're going to get the, the gist now when I perform a search. Watch what the difference is in the desktop interface. So now when I do a search for door, this comes up, you can see that those channels have now been, they're part of a group. And so what's what's happening is we're prioritizing the display of the search results based on the group that you've associated with that plugin from which you're doing the search. So here you can see that, but this interface is also designed to let them break, the user break out of that primary grouping into their secondary groupings of content to go look for something. In this case, maybe visualization content. These assignments, though, not to get too too in the weeds with this, you're going to be able to assign multiple groups per plugin. So I could say uh, I could create a group. Um, I could create a primary Revit grouping, which is my standards library. Call that Revit standards group. Put two or three channels of content. Maybe you've got your families on the channel, your drafting views, whatever you want people to consume from. Now we've got key cards. It's actually making it easier to put all that in one channel and associate it. But then you might create a secondary grouping that is maybe unvetted content that people still need to be able to get access to, but it's not your primary library. And then you may have, you know, we've introduced this uh, avail select manufacturers content. So if I if I go back, this is actually pretty cool. So now if I'm um, now if I am in Revit and I knew that there was manufacturer like fully, boom, I can do a search, get right into that manufacturer's content that's uh, what, coming out of one of these avail select channels of content and, uh, and be able to uh, you know, get to that manufacturer content. The cool thing I think about this from, you know, if I'm projecting onto what you all will want is you could now put the manufacturer content in its own grouping, make it available, but put it further down the priority list. You want them to look at your standards library first and then be able to pop over if they want to and look at manufacturer content or manufacturer kind of specific things. So anyway, we're working on this, trying to get this done. I uh, think it's going to be a uh, not only very useful, uh, it's going to help clean up search. I think, as you can imagine, this is going to start to manifest itself in letting you maybe see your channels on the front of the avail desktop in a different way. That'll probably become a feature of 5.0 as we work on it and try to get that released. So um, I think that's it. Um, let me just quickly show you uh, the Well, we may have lost him. Randall, you able to hear us? He said, that's it. And I guess Zoom said, okay, well, can you hear us again, Randall? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I 
See that I lost everything. I lost connection. I was uh, VPNed into my desktop doing this, but let me see if I can get back in. You're, you're back now. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, my last my last uh, bit here was just to uh, uh, throw up the roadmap. So we've been working on, you know, and, and really this, what I've just been talking about is it doesn't even really show up here. We've been working on obviously trying to get that Revit workflow kind of an ongoing basis. We are working on a new version of Harvest, uh, which is coming along. Uh, no promises on exactly when that. Uh, here's what I'll say. We've been, you know, been telling everybody we've been moving all that processing to Forge. I've actually got interfaces on my desk, not the interfaces you'll be using, but we're actually already we're doing that. We're actually processing this data now on the back end of Forge and getting the results in Avail. So we're doing the work now to get the ultimate um, interfaces that you'll use to do that in place. So that's coming uh, along very quickly. That's also the basis for a new archive feature, which is going to let you uh, basically chew on historical project data and have access to it without having to go open the Revit projects. And then ultimately we're working towards, you know, as I said, Avail 5.0, which will be a major new release. The primary feature of that, besides workspaces in the Avail desktop, are related to Revit around that project navigation. So that project mode that I was talking about earlier, if you are aware of it, you kind of know it's it's a pretty cool feature. We got we got some people that are using it religiously. Most people don't even know it's there, and we haven't really we don't talk about it a lot. It was kind of an experiment for us, uh, but it's it's going to turn into a very viable thing. Uh, what we're now calling Avail Live for Revit, and there's going to be new ability to navigate your projects from the desktop, and that's where as that as those new features progress, there's probably going to be some new things that'll sneak into that interface where that search bar is in Revit. So that's why I was talking earlier about, there's probably some other things that are gonna to start to show up there uh, sooner than later. So a um, bunch of new uh, good stuff on the way. Hopefully um, you liked what you saw. There's nothing like getting your hands on it, testing it yourself. It also helps us to understand if, if there's any, uh, any problems or bugs uh, that we can try to cap capture, catch before we get this out into production. But uh, Todd, any last questions? We had a couple of questions uh, just along, just um, related to some of the things you've mentioned in new releases. Um, one of those was just, you know, do we have recommendations on, you know, now with key cards and this grouping of channels on on how you might group channels together, like by Revit version, or, you know, is there any thoughts or plans on like avail auto sensing, you know, the Revit? session you're in and you know bringing up the correct channel or something like that yes so we're we're as we're developing these features we're trying to think those things through about how you know this could help to accommodate that um you know Revit just made life hard with all this versioning version you know it's it's a weird concept it's a weird thing to have to try to manage you know what I'll say about the work that we're doing with Avail is we're trying at the core of Avail. I always like to remind everybody that Avail knows nothing about Revit. It knows nothing about uh, MicroStation or Rhino or any of the other kinds of things that we're doing with it at its core level. It's about core content management, core search, finding information and doing something with it. And then we go deep dive with these features and plugins to solve very specific problems like how to manage Revit content. What I will go ahead and say is with the Harvest 3.0 initiative and our work that's going on in Forge, we're actually already working towards how to automatically support multiple versions of content. And we're working through how that will ultimately manifest itself back in the interface so that it's simple for the users to not have to worry about it and but have the right versions available. Um, so there's probably gonna be some purpose work that's done on that front around what we're doing with cloud processing. And, and to be honest, what's gonna be the easiest around that front is to 
support that feature for that content to only be hosted in the cloud and probably our cloud. It gets really complex when we're both trying to create all that content and then ultimately let you store it wherever you want to store it. It makes it makes for a very complex situation. So we're we're moving towards a solution around that front. Um, and then um, but not necessarily trying to support it everywhere. So anyway, that's all that that's that's literally as much as I know that this is an ongoing conversation right now uh, that's going on. But we we are working towards a solution on Reddit version handling. And there was just a question on the manufacturer content. Is for manufacturers, is there a way to add product model libraries or is it pulled from a, a central library like BIM 360? Um, say that again, Todd. Yeah, sure thing. Um, <laughs> well, and, 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 and this uh, question may be coming from someone who's not familiar with the Avail Select, which I know you've you've had a chance to speak to on some other webinars recently. But maybe you could you could just say what where is this manufacturer select content currently coming from? Okay, so it's coming from manufacturers. We have um, a group that's in the building product manufacturer market that's helping. Um, I'll just say the relationships between the suppliers, the manufacturers, and where the content is. What I'll say about this content, let me just go into one of these channels to show you. Um, all of the content, uh, by and large, was created by a third party a company called Ingeworks, which is a professional Reddit content services company uh, based out of Chicago, but make a lot of especially on the MEP side, a lot of fabrication ready, high quality content. So for us, one of the most important things around this was to make sure that the content that was being delivered uh, was as of high quality as possible without us having to be the ones to QA, QC every bit of it. So a lot of this content, uh, almost all of it was created either by Ingeworks or it was created by the manufacturer in-house. It is one of the um, criteria that we actually publish is who developed the content. So that'll help you all to start to understand uh, where it's coming from or who made it. Um, this is being hosted in Avail's cloud hosting service. But as you bring it down, right, your, your, uh, like any other channel, when you subscribe to it, it's free to subscribe to it if you're an enterprise customer, uh, you can uh, route um, where that content is going to go and be downloaded to on your central network if you want to. Uh, there's also uh, some exciting things that we're doing around, I'll just say, the Harvest 3.0 initiative and processing of Revit data that we think we're going to be able to apply to manufacturer content. So you can imagine kind of mass customization, I'll say, of content as it comes into your environment, to your liking and desires. Uh, so there's, we're kind of road mapping out some, some interesting things that we think that we'll be able to do to help on that front. But the first thing that we ask is go subscribe to those channels in the marketplace and get people starting to look at it and use it because we need to be able to go back to the manufacturers and say, thumbs up, our customers want more of this. Uh, we've already had several customers, you know, give us feedback on other manufacturers they'd like. That's all sorely needed to be able to get the energy that's needed to go get the manufacturers to do the things that we need them to do or want them to do. So we're trying to fight that fight for you guys. Um, so what, what's most helpful is for you to go subscribe to it because we have to, we need to report back that our customers are subscribing to these channels and searching them and looking for this kind of information content. And then any other feedback you want to give us on that front, be sure to you know work through Todd and the customer success team on the support side, give us feedback on that. We'll do some one-on-ones if we need to. And, uh, and work towards that end. Any more, Todd? Um, one just came in, just reading through. Um, I think, in short, the question is, can items that come out of a marketplace channel, like out of the box libraries, can that be tagged um, additionally to put your own kind of tags on something? The, um not not within the in the channel you can't add tags to that avail select channel 
as you bring content down though, you can make that part of your own channels. You can put that content in your own channel, right? Even in mm -hmm. the mail, and then you can add tags to it. Correct. Um, I think that covers it. There was one quick question on just, you know, uh, somebody was new to key cards and where you launched that from. So I also pointed them towards a recent webinar on that. But um, if you wanted to, with the extra minute we have here to share that, but up to you. And say, sorry, I lost your time. Say it again. Sorry. Oh, just pointing out where the key card editor is to oh. enable key cards. That's all. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. If you go into any channel uh, that you have editing privileges on, um, when you're in that channel, you should uh, see, hopefully you've been using tag IO and are familiar with that lens right below it. Now you should see the key card editor. So for instance, if I launch the key card editor, you will see for this channel that I used element type. You can add, you're basically elevating your key value pairs of data, the keys. Uh, obviously, the name key cards is driven by the keys. There are my element types. And then uh, on each of these, you then have an editor to either add a custom image, uh, customize that. Here are all the Revit categories. If you go to the newly named avail, learn uh, avail <laughs> help me todd what do we rename it the let's go look what, what is it you're looking for sorry oh we renamed the oh the uh, installers uh, and publisher resources and installers yeah. and publisher resources channel uh used to just be the installers but now when you're in that channel we are giving you some more resources like these key cards and giving you some of the images that we created like the revit uh, you know, category images so that you can customize them. And this is what I was talking about at the top of the call. We're going to have a contest uh, where over the next couple of months, we're asking customers who've already started, you know, we've seen already over the last year, just some really beautiful work that people have done on channel cards and really making avail come alive, you know, in the brand or in, in the image of our customers who are using it. Uh, these key cards are another opportunity to begin to do that. So we're going to have a a contest for one to let you all show it off and then uh, hopefully inspire others about what you've done on that front and then ultimately we're going to ask you if it's something that you're willing to share the templates that you created share them uh, we're going to just try to make these resources available for everybody so that we're not all redoing the same work so uh, we'll try to facilitate that through that process that's all the questions wow we did pretty good just three minutes over <laughs> all right well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, we'll get logged in if you don't have 4.3 or you don't haven't installed those preview releases, get logged into the manage portal where you can do the downloads. The you can't find the preview releases in the uh, in the avail installers channel, but only over on the manage portal you'll have access to those preview releases. Uh, but go ahead and get that avail browser for Revit 5.0 installed and start um, kind of putting your hands on it and getting a feel for what that looks like. And then hopefully uh, the information I gave you today gives you a little bit better insight into what that experience is meant to be and some of the other uh, kind of improvements to that experience that are forthcoming here in the next few weeks. Uh, so thanks, everybody.